Nicolina Ivanov. You're the production designer for Lovecraft Country, which combines supernatural horror with the history of racism during the Jim Crow era. But uh, really, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what the show is, because it spans centuries and continents and even planets sometimes in its storytelling. Uh, so how did the sheer scope of this work that this show called for compared to other TV shows and films that you've worked on throughout your career? Well, I've absolutely the most unique experience. I don't think there are many shows written like that or envisioned like that. And of course it starts with the book. The book was like an anthology and the book uh, uh, had each character had its own chapter and its own journey. Uh, but then Misha took it a notch up and uh, literally uh, dialed it all the way up <laughs> uh, in terms of what she wanted to say with the show and how she uh, put it on paper. And a lot of the, um, even the musical cues were already into the script. And so it was a really magnificent um, piece to read because I had to read about 500 pages all at once. And then I, I was asked to design them all at once too, you know? So it was like doing three movies all at once. So very challenging, but very, very exciting. Having to design all at once, uh, what, what, is, what is that process like? Uh, is it a lot of sketching, a lot of research, a lot of, you know, back and forth with Misha? Well, all of it, all of it. it I had to work, uh, the only thing I asked is if we could just not do Korea yet. I was just, the only thing I was just saying like, look, that's its own unique world. Let's table this for now. And we all agreed we we're gonna shoot it in the last episode. And I just uh, said like, um, let me think about the overarching arc of the design and, uh, and the color palette and the realness of the 1955 black lives during the Jim Crow. Uh, and then how we take those concepts and now make them magical and transform. So at the very, at the beginning, I was going between scouting in Atlanta and designing in, uh, in LA to be near Misha. And, and I had a tiny team and the producers. And so it was quite complex. It was a lot of it uh, had to go um, uh, back and forth, but the goal was to create a conceptual book in a couple of months that gave us all the ideas on, on, on in one design book so we can look at all the research and all the thoughts. I, some of my sketches, some of the early concepts and just kind of pitch it to HBO um, and, 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 and take it to them and say, say to them, this is the show we have. Uh, and so the first time I presented this, Misha, uh, Bill Carraro, a producer, and I went to Bed Robert and we presented the book. And I remember uh, Ben Stevenson saying, well, no other show looks like that. And, and it just, make me so happy because it was the absolute truth. There is no other show that looked like that. And, um, but yeah, that took about a couple of two, two and a half months. So it's pretty fast, really, if you think about it. Um, but so it was a lot of work, <laughs> but good, all good. <laughs> And, and what was kind of the proportion of, you know, scouting locations and using locations versus, versus sets that, you know, had to be built from scratch? Well, the, uh, we had 11 large sets. We had a lot to build, but you couldn't build it before you knew what the location looked like. So even if you were, let's just take Ardham Lodge. You know, you were going to create your mythical lodge because it doesn't really exist, right? But you still have to start with a real place. You have to find something on the ground that is that is real. So um, it, that, was, that was constantly like I had to find it was a chicken and egg problem, <laughs> you know, what, what goes first? Uh, so you had to find, you had to find your key locations and that in order to be able to build your world on top of them, does that make sense? And augment them uh, through visual effects or through um, any, or through interpretation. Um, and so the very first pieces of order were like finding Ardham Lodge, finding the Winthrop house, which is the haunted house. And because all of these interiors were eventually set on stage. So you had in both cases, in one case, you just had the ground floor, which was the, the, the Ardham Lodge. In the other one, you had the shell of the house, you had the exterior and the yard, but then everything that went inside was all set. So we started with 11 big sets. So the building was quite a bit of, and I would say the majority of the show actually was set construction. 
it was very savvy, uh, had said building heavy. And we had four, um, almost five stages. And one was a double size. We had a lot of stages. <laughs> Um, and, and, and right from, from the get-go with Artem Lodge and, and the events that happened there, the destruction of it, the ritual that happens there, you know, the, your design work is interacting with a lot of visual effects throughout the series. Uh, so how, how closely were you working with the, the visual effects department to create the look and, and, to, and to sometimes create the magnificent destruction that we sometimes see? Um, very, very close. We, we, we went hand in hand. I think Kevin Blank, our, our visual effects supervisor, came in. I want to say he came in about maybe a couple of months after I was hired, something like that, but the, or, or maybe a month and a half. But right off the bat, we were working very closely. And at the beginning, he was focusing more on the Shoggoths and some of those creatures. But we all agreed that we were going to work with Rodeo, um, which is a VFX house, a magnificent place. Uh, and, and so I was able to develop some of the key concepts with them because I do black and white sketches. So I will work out all the architectural proportions and what I wanted to look like, but they will do the color and they did uh, beautiful work. So even in that first presentation, we already had Artem Lodge fully concepted, uh, the look of it, uh, not necessarily all the interior spaces, but we had the, the, actually the place, the dome, uh, the collapsing of it. We had actually uh, really spot on concepts that just came to life further into post-production, but we were very, very accurate, even from the very beginning with what we wanted to create. Um, it was really, uh, I'm not, now looking back at it and thinking about it, I'm not sure how I did it, <laughs> but somehow, you know, because when I look at it, I go like, really, we didn't have much time, but yeah, somehow, you know, when you love something, uh, you you do it. <laughs> um, and you know, later in the season after after Artem Lodge and the uh, the the haunted house, uh, you go into so many various other directions. For instance, the uh, the episode underneath the museum, this kind of system of catacombs leading up to uh, mm -hmm. the the vault uh, where where you know they're looking for a book of magic. Um, it feels very much uh, like an Indiana Jones style adventure movie, that episode. Uh, you know, what were kind of some of the inspirations? Was that one of the inspirations for creating the look and feel of those spaces? Yeah, because like, you know, Misha and I would always joke, but we would kind of uh, give them, we were always each episode, like for example, episode two, the Artem Lodge was our Stanley Kubrick, uh, Barry Lyndon episode, because I pitched her the idea of candlelight. I said, let's do Barry Lyndon. And then she wanted Goonies for four. And, it, you know, and very much Goonies is in that wheelhouse. It's in the Indiana Jones. Yes, that's what it, that's what it felt like. Uh, so we always had kind of nicknames for the episodes and the worlds we wanted to play with because we were doing um we were playing with the, with those themes and we were using them you know through the prism of of our character's journey uh and uh but but we were definitely referencing those and four was technically incredible four and seven were technically probably the most complex episodes we had to do because uh, just of the tunnels uh, be, starting from dry to going to wet to, to water and then having the different um levels of water into the same we had to build our own tank so we built a 60 foot di um, diameter tank um, um and um and so we we it was quite an engineering um conundrum in a way and we were very successful in thinking of like making uh, ma making them at different levels. So so as you walk, as the characters walk through them, they start at a very high level. So it, the water is always at the same level, right? But they're walking from a very high level to a very low level. So therefore they start sinking and then that becomes like up to here. And, and th just the technical challenge of keeping the water crystal clear was quite something when we kept a sample of our rocks, painted sample, finished sample for a month under in a tub to see if it will start disintegrating because you need you can't have particles coming off the paint or anything like that so it was very very interesting and then compounded by a ship that we had to build and destroy in one day so we <laughs> we had like seven cameras one shot that was it one take it was some of the ship to to get uh, you know flooded it was really a very complex technically episode yes 
Uh, I was wondering if you, you mentioned having like nicknames for each episode. Uh, what, did you have one for I Am, which is this episode that spans so many different eras just in that one episode? You're in the future, in outer space, you're uh, in the past. Uh, like, yeah. What, yeah. what went into making that one? Well, that was the space is the place. That was the, <laughs> you know, that was, that was the, that, that was what was referring to, to Afro, Afrofuturism and Sun Ra. So, and the writing of Sun Ra. And I just, it happens so that my husband is a musician and he has, he had played with Sun Ra. So I was very, very much uh, tickled by that. But that's probably my personal favorite episode, just because, just because uh, it's about a woman's journey and he takes you to places that uh, really, you know, from 200 years back from the Dahomey Kingdom, 200 years back to 200 years into the future to multiple planets <laughs> that each of them had to be invented. I mean, the amount of fun I had on that episode, it's, pro it's practically criminal. <laughs> it was just so much fun. <laughs> And, and with those with those side of kind of new planets, uh, you're you're basically creating this thing from scratch, and yet they also feel like kind of something out of classic, you know, sci-fi literature or or you know old old sci-fi movies. Uh, like, what were you? Did you look at a lot of old sci-fi to kind of inspire yourself for those? Absolutely, uh, 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 Red Planet. <laughs> You know, there's just there's some wonderful 1950s science fiction. And of course, I looked at a lot of the uh, book covers of the science fiction uh, books at the time and magazines. And, and and again, some of it had to be from these characters, like her drawings had to be had to have the sensibility of a 12 year old, you know, uh, the first planet. But then I was just able to go off on my own and. Um, I was uh, very inspired by a very early childhood book uh, that I loved, uh, The, the uh, Little Prince. And I've always wanted to do my own version of The Little Prince. So when we got to, the, to, to Nellis, that's what I was channeling. Um, but you know, your, your dreams, your personal dreams sometimes as a designer and, as, and as a, in, in your personal experiences are infused with those of the characters too. So um, it was a great, that was a great journey. And then we had to do a musical number with Josephine Baker. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was quite the episode. <laughs> Um, and another uh, episode that seemed like it would have been uh, a large undertaking would have been the Rewind uh, 1921 episode that recreates Tulsa uh, at the, you know, at the time of the, uh, of the massacre that took place there. Uh, you know, you're, cre you're, you're bringing the cast to an entirely different place. Uh, like how, how, much of, how much building and, 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 and preparation and research had to go into that one? I mean, a lot. I mean, each episode, I would say, was I just started very early on. And, and so I would work, like, even for an episode like that, even if it's shot in November, I was all, already working on it in June. You know, like, I was already gathering uh, information and, and, uh, and learning about it. And, and one of the things that was very critical, because Greenwood Avenue was so prominent and so large, it was a double wide boulevard. It was incredible. The neighborhood was so rich and, 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 and Black people were prospering. And to, we had to ha find a location that had that scale and magnificence because you have to feel the pain of something that what Black people accomplished in 1921, how it got destroyed, the loss of that needs to needs to feel, um, it needs to bring tears to your eyes. So for that one, we knew from the beginning we couldn't find it in Atlanta. So we went uh, in Macon, uh, which is about an hour and a half outside of Atlanta, which has incredibly period bones, um, preserved uh, bone structures and really the large scale of streets that we needed. And so that added, um, we were very, very determined to do it there, you know, and we dressed uh, a, a, about two blocks of the street. The rest of it, we extended with a visual effect, but we fully dressed two blocks fully, like every single store when 1920s. And one of the most interesting things was about the period cars in that episode is I think the script said that it, the car drives really fast. Well, they can't go above 15 miles an hour. <laughs> they literally, <laughs> so some stuff like that was like, oh yeah, hmm. 1920 they don't go that fast the vehicles <laughs> it was some some interesting things we all learned <laughs> from using such you know very early uh cars and and, and mechanisms 
Um, and you know, given everything, uh, you know, all the different places and all of the different locales uh, that you had to create or go to, do you feel like you're kind of prepared for anything, any like, uh, you know, design <laughs> challenge in the future? I mean, you already have such a, 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 an, extended, a an extensive career before this, but now let's just, everything. I 100%. I would say yes. I mean, I think like if you could, if you could do Lovecraft Country, you could do anything from now on, you know, like, I mean, whoever wants, whoever wants to dream, call me, <laughs> whichever direction. I also was lucky enough to be prepared for a show like that because I had studied theater. And I think theater background helps because when we study theater, we're taught to design multiple genres. You do from musicals to, to uh, uh, straightforward dramas, to Eugene O'Neill, to Shakespeare. You do, uh, and you do ballet and you do opera. And these are very different genres. And now that I think about it, um, it was a very, very good foundation to be able to handle a show like Lovecraft Country with so, such multiple challenges. And then also uh, in my career, I had never wanted to get stuck in a genre. So I was always a little bit of a wanderer between genres. So <laughs> I think I found my home <laughs> in Lovecraft Country, <laughs> you know, uh, because of that. But yes, I agree with you. Uh, give me a Marvel, Marvel movie. I don't know, I can do anything. <laughs> it's true. Well, I want to congratulate you on your work on uh, Lovecraft Country um, and all of, and someone give you a Marvel movie. Yes, I absolutely agree. Because uh, you know, your design <laughs> well, work here. I just want Misha to write it though, because I think that one of the most, uh, I mean, for me to succeed, I have to have a, a showrunner like Misha also. Uh, you know, I don't do this alone and I have to have the producers that I had. And Misha encouraged me to, to think big and to think bold. And she wanted that. And I just, feel like that is a very important part of the process and a lot of credit should go to her as uh, as the sort of the mastermind of this entire project <laughs> yes well i mean if marvel wants to make a uh a misha green movie with uh, kalina ivanov yes. production design i'm 100 there that ticket is already sold so make it happen <laughs> uh disney marvel uh, uh, until then uh thank you so much for joining me congratulations on your work and all your, thank you, know, you. Got coming up. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.